so this, this project is going to look into, or has been looking into the development of optimization algorithms. Um, and it is in collaboration with uh, faculty in mechanical engineering, Dr. Carl Crane, um, and uh, computer science, Dr. Sanjay Ranka, and, um, and their team. So um, the, the project um, is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, we are now in the fourth year. Uh, we're finishing, the f uh, we're in the process of the fifth year, which is the transition to practice. Um, we have, um, uh, in addition to the development of the um, optimization algorithms, we've been doing a lot of simulation um, to, to evaluate uh, different alternatives. And uh, the, uh, the ultimate objective is to be able to implement that an, uh, at an intersection in, uh, in Gainesville. Um, and that's part of, uh, of the iStreet testbed. Um, the, the project team, uh, uh, faculty and uh, sci uh, staff scientists uh, listed um, above, and then several uh, graduate students from the, from the three departments. Uh, we also have a collaboration with ISS, which is an industry partner. Um, they're the developers of the Autoscope, so they've been involved from the detection point of view, uh, the radar and, uh, and video. And uh, Econolite has also um, assisted. Uh, they donated a, a controller. They're a major uh, uh, signal controller manufacturer. Um, so uh, the, of course, the, the motivation is we have the opportunity with autonomous vehicles to kind of control the way that they travel. And especially when we're talking about uh, bottlenecks, like a um, signalized intersection, uh, the better we can process uh, traffic, the more efficient, the higher the throughput is, is going to be and the higher the, the travel time. Um, there has been in the, in the literature um, a kind of a um, reservation, it's called reservation-based code, where you, um, you have autonomous vehicles approaching the intersection, they request um, the space at the intersection, and the reservation may accept be accepted or, or rejected. That's it's called the reservation-based um, optimization uh, code, and it was developed from uh, the University of Texas. Um, but in our approach, the way we're looking at it is, we wanted to jointly optimize the movement of the vehicles together with um, the signal control. So it it's, it takes it to the to the next level where you have. Um, information from the vehicle into the controller um, or the central uh, optimization mechanism. You, all, um, you optimize both and then you disseminate um, again to both. To the signal controller, you send signal timings into the vehicle's um, uh, movement information. So um, the, um, the other aspect was that we wanted to also have, of course, connectivity. Uh, as I was mentioning this morning that um, my feeling is that we cannot um, rely entirely on just autonomy without having some interaction um, with, um, with the infrastructure because there's a lot more information that you can gain uh, from, from the, infra from the infra infrastructure. So example, for signal control. Um, wouldn't it be nice if the vehicle already had information about when the signal will turn green, and then they can plan uh, their trajectory. So even at that level, it's important to have that kind of um, advanced information. Or think about um, emergency vehicles, when uh, you have a siren going. Um, how is an autonomous vehicle going to listen? Are they, are they going to be able to hear the sirens? Uh, so you need another type of um, way to communicate there is that there is an emergency vehicle um, approaching. So, um, so the research is based on both autonomous and connected vehicles. Um, and uh, it's, it required the development of um, sensor information so that our system could work in a, conven in a conventional vehicle environment as well. So that when we implement it, of course, we're not going to be only have we're not going to be able to only have autonomous and connected vehicles. We have to incorporate conventional vehicles. So there's a lot um, that goes into it in terms of the sensor development and how we can um, identify conventional vehicles, how we can 
anticipate their movement and optimize for the vehicles that are able to receive optimal uh, trajectories. So I'm going to talk about the um, overall uh, project and the, the concept. Um, and then I'll, I'm going to show you some results from, uh, first from simulation for uh, what happens when you have full autonomy. Um, I'll talk about um, our approach for optimization for mixed traffic, so meaning autonomous connected and conventional. Um, I'll talk about the simulation environment, where we are with that. Um, the issues with sensors and the work that we've done on uh, sensor fusion to maximize the information that we're gathering from, uh, from different sources. Um, and then the transition to practice uh, component. So here's how the, how the concept works. We have um, information um, from autonomous vehicles uh, that uh, are able to um, communicate their location through DSRC, which stands for Dedicated Short Range Communication. Uh, we may have uh, just the DSRC information from, uh, from connected vehicles, and then we have connected or uh, conventional vehicles which provide zero information, and so we have to have a way um, to detect their, um, their uh, presence and uh, their approaching the intersection. Um, so based on the information that we gather from vehicles approaching, we have our uh, sensor fusion and the hybrid sensor that combines all this information and determines what the vehicle arrivals are within the communication range for the, for the intersection. Once this is obtained, then that is fed into the uh, controller um, optimization module. Um, and what we're doing there is we're predicting based on a set of arrivals um, how the vehicles are going to depart from the intersection. Um, of course, you need to have a reasonable communication range to be able to get this information at the distance far upstream from the intersection where you're able to calculate and then project um, trajectories. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk some more about the communication range um, later and the uh, implications related to that. Um, and so based on that, then we have the the flow, um, the, the um, flow of the data, um, the different types of uh, information that is being collected um, and is being um, disseminated. So, one of the issues uh, is once you gather this information, even if you have given, you are, if you know what the signalization will be, and let's say when the signal is going to be green, then you can develop a trajectory um, such that you can minimize your headways at the departure. So you minimize the headways and you maximize the speed. And that way you can maximize the, the throughput at the stop bar. So the algorithm that we came up with um, was to uh, develop trajectories such that we are able to accomplish that. Um, one of the important elements for that is that you need to know when the vehicle approaches the intersection whether it's going to go through or turn left or turn right because that affects the speed at which the vehicle is going to be able to make uh, to make the turn and so in our algorithm we have to know the direction of the vehicle so that we know whether it's going to turn or not and from that we determine the speed um, so in the um, case for opti optimization for full autonomous vehicles, which was actually the easy case. Um, this is our, our test um, intersection. We designed it such that um, we have a certain communication range. Um, and so the vehicles, as they approach, this is the location where we assume now we have information about their, uh, their speed, um, and uh, their destination. And so when they enter this communication range, that's when we grab that information and that feeds into the, the controller. So this is um, kind of our first uh, test case and uh, simulation. And one of the first um, cases what we did is we, uh, we developed an optimization process um, which looks at 
the lead vehicle, if there's a lead vehicle in a platoon that is unencumbered, it has a certain trajectory that it can follow. If it has to follow another vehicle, then it has a certain uh, set of requirements in terms of um, the, um, the headway that it's going to keep and, um, and the speed that it's going to be able to have. And so for every vehicle that enters the communication range, we can calculate uh, the hypothetical uh, trajectory that would achieve minimum headway and maximum speed. Now that's not going to be able, we're not going to be able to do that with every single vehicle. Sometimes the vehicle ahead is slower and so you're not going to be able to maintain um, a maximum or a minimum headway and a maximum speed. So, but we start with what's our hypoth hypothetical um, trajectory and then we, uh, we process the, the trajectories from that. And here's kind of how it, how it looks like, what it looks like. So we have, um, as vehicles are, are entering, uh, this is the, um, the vehicle arrivals. We, we process that and we are able to project then based on those arrivals how we're going to set up our signal timing so that we're able to process these vehicles with nobody stopping. So we are we're creating um, platoons with the movement of vehicles. And remember, these are fully autonomous. So in theory, I can completely control the way they go through the approach. So I can set them up so that they, some accelerate, some decelerate, but they all depart at that minimum headway and at that maximum speed. If everybody's autonomous, I can do that. Um, and we have this rolling horizon scheme where we detect vehicles here. We, uh, we do that with every approach. We project what the signal timing will be, and then we go through um, the next stage. And we have um, the rolling horizon says, all right, I'm now I'm calculating what happens based on this, and I'm projecting um, how this will, uh, will play out um, several uh, cycles later. And uh, in, in this particular um, optimization with, autonomy, with uh, fully, full autonomy, um, we use genetic algorithms to determine what the optimal uh, signal timings will be, what the optimal trajectories will be, um, and, uh, and provide the, the output. In, um, we had started before this one, when, um, we had started with a very, very simple one lane, two, two conflicting lanes, basically, um, in which case you only have a two-phase signal. And we, had st we started with just enumerating all the different options, because if you only have uh, two phases, then it's very easy uh, to just do enumeration. But then when we got to a more complex one, we, we went with, um, with genetic algorithms. So here's what the... Um, uh, the results show, and this is uh, based on, uh, on simulation again. Um, the, the graph here on top uh, sh shows demand versus average uh, travel time delay, um, and the bottom one shows uh, throughput as a function of, of demand. And we have our proposed algorithm is the lighter one, and the, uh, we have actuated control as kind of the uh, the comparison case. And what, what you can see in terms of uh, delay is that you, um, we were able to reduce delay um, much more significantly for the higher demand scenarios. When you have low demand, it really doesn't make much of a difference. You're not gaining much by controlling um, all the movements. But when you get to the uh, higher demand scenarios, we were able to go down by uh, almost 80% um, in terms of, um, of delay. Um, similarly, with the, with the throughput, you're not seeing much of a benefit until you get to the higher um, demand scenarios. Um, the previous uh, set of graphs was showing kind of balanced demand from the different approaches, and then we tested scenarios with unbalanced demand, where uh, two of the approaches had lower demand, and we had a kind of a major uh, major roadway, minor roadway, and so uh, the splits of the demands are, um, are shown here. And again, um, it in, 
in a fully autonomous uh, vehicle scenario, it doesn't matter how you split your demands. It doesn't matter where vehicles are coming from. We're still able to, uh, to modify the signal control uh, to accommodate them. We also looked into the, the effects of the communication range. Um, currently, the DSRC is able to detect vehicles at about 1,500 uh, feet. Um, and so the graphs here show um, the communication range versus um, different um, uh, versus delay for different uh, demand scenarios. And so um, the conclusion there is you can make a difference when with the existing DSRC range of about 1,500 feet. Uh, if you have short, uh, much shorter. Um, 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 communication range, you're not able to anticipate the movement and implement it in time to gain um, uh, benefits. But uh, beyond a certain point uh, in the communication range, it doesn't matter as much. You gain most of the, uh, of the benefits from it. Um, in doing that, uh, this kind of an exercise, and for us, we were interested in um, um, a transition to practice where we had to implement this out in the field. So we started looking into this relationship between uh, the optimization interval that we're looking at. So how frequently should we be optimizing and giving optimal uh, signal timings and optimal trajectories um, versus what is the communication range versus what is the approach speed. Because if you have very high approach speeds, the vehicle is going to get to the stop bar much faster. And so you need more time to be able to develop a trajectory and send it out uh, within a reasonable amount of time. The other part is if I'm doing my optimization every interval uh, shown there, by the time I have uh, completed this interval, my first vehicle has already moved by a certain amount. And the faster that speed is the, uh, of the approach, the more the vehicle has moved. So by the time it has moved and I provide an optimal trajectory, then it's too late. The vehicle is too close. I cannot uh, provide an optimal trajectory effectively and also change the signalization. And so we developed this relationship between the approach speed, um, the communication range, and the interval in the that that the optimization interval. So, the higher uh, the speed, the longer your communication range needs to be in order to be able to uh, effectively develop trajectories and send them and have them implemented. And that doesn't even account for the calculation time um, or the any, any extra time that it may take to send that information, which is actually, in our tests, it's negligible. It's, it doesn't take long to calculate and it doesn't take long to send um, that information. Uh, so that was, a lot was for autonomous vehicles. I'm going to show you. Um, what uh, uh, what we did with respect to um, mixed traffic. So now we we want to have um, conventional vehicles, and if you have conventional vehicles, then you have to follow the rules for those. You need to have um, uh, cer certain minimum intervals. You need to have a certain sequence. Uh, you can't just uh, uh, provide. Um, you know, only for autonomous vehicles. So it's, um, and we also had to account for the movement of conventional vehicles and unexpected movement from autonomous vehicles. Um, so um, in this case, we are selecting, we have a set of phases um, which would kind of correspond to the phases that we have now with signal control. And based on those phases, then we can decide to extend or not extend, um, offer or not offer a particular phase based on the demand. So it is, um, it's a more advanced 
um, optimization than the actuated control because you are still optimizing based on the um, anticipated movement and you're optimizing the vehicle trajectories uh, for, the for the vehicles that are able to accept it, but uh, you we are still keeping the, the signal phasing um, compatible with for conventional vehicles. I'm going to show you the results, um, which may look scary because there's so many different variables here, uh, but let me uh, kind of go through this. Um, so the the top shows average travel time. Um, the second one shows average delay. The last one shows um, average uh, effective green. Each of the columns shows different saturation headways. So the first one is one second, the second is 1.5, and then two. Um, and then the um, size of the bubble uh, shows the autonomous vehicle ratio. The larger the bubble, um, the higher the AV ratio. So and it goes from uh, 0.3 all the way to 1, so 100% um, autonomy. Um, and the colors um, show the, the communication range. When you have uh, red is 500 and uh, all the way to green is about um, 3,000. So uh, first of all, um, when you, you see larger bubbles, higher um, uh, percent of autonomous vehicles, we end up having lower, um, lower delays. Um, and you can, uh, you can kind of see that, uh, especially in the um, uh, saturation headways uh, of two, but uh, generally uh, the, the more autonomy uh, we introduce the higher that percent, the, the lower the, the delays. Uh, what's also very clear is that the minimum saturation headway affects travel time, and this is not something that, uh, this would be something that autonomous vehicle manufacturers have to decide how they're going to, to approach. Um, and it, it may end up being more of a variable rather than a constant for everybody. The communication range did not affect delay beyond a certain point. Um, and then what was also interesting was that when you have higher flow rates, we had generally lower effective greens, so that was there was more frequent switching uh, from one phase to the other um, because of the competing uh, demands from, uh, from different movements. And uh, this one was uh, an, a comparison between um, what our algorithm was showing versus what uh, evaluation, what Visim uh, was able to, uh, was, was replicating for kind of conventional uh, traffic. Um, again, that's as, as expected, we have for higher flows um, and uh, lower saturation headwinds, we get uh, much more improved uh, conditions relative to, to conventional traffic. Um, and uh, we ended up with higher um, average effective greens because we were uh, reducing the, the gap outs from the signalization. Um, in one of our, of our more recent versions of the algorithm, what we ended up doing is um, in the previous versions, we were optimizing once, giving optimal trajectories, and that was the, uh, the end of the optimization. But what happened was, when you have high demands, um, you end up having vehicles being in the, uh, in the system for longer than one cycle. So you, you have what we call cycle failures. Um, and so that's number one. Number two, with conventional vehicles, yes, you may predict what they're going to do, but I, what if they don't? What if you think that they're going to cross, but they really go slower than what you anticipated? How do you account for changes based on um, uh, movement that is different than what was expected? So we ended up developing a slightly different algorithm that um, re-evaluates every certain number of seconds and says, 
now where are my vehicles and do I need to make adjustments to the signalization based on new information about where the vehicle is now. Um, and we ended up um, implementing this um, and uh, in the, the first couple of algorithms were, were in uh, MATLAB. Then we transitioned into Python so that we would be able to have a better way to implement this feedback loop. And uh, with this feedback loop and uh, multiple um, optimization uh, steps within uh, uh, for the for each of the trajectories, we implemented this in a uh, given an intersection in in Gainesville with with multiple lanes, and uh, we did again uh, several different scenarios with different volumes, different uh, uh, connected autonomous vehicle uh, percentages in um, in traffic, and what this shows is the average throughput for different scenarios. Um, when you have uh, a demand of about 250, uh, then you're able to, of course, get similar throughput regardless because you have not exceeded capacity. When you're going uh, down to 850, now you can see where your throughput is for each of, the, uh, of those percentages with Zero autonomous vehicles, you're at 568, but when you go to about 100, you're able to, we're able to, to have uh, more organized uh, distribution of the, of the vehicles, and so we, have, uh, we, we maximize the throughput and we're able to get it up to 635. Uh, so um, maybe uh, 8 to 10 percent uh, increase. The other thing that we are that we looked at is what is what happens to the um, to the variability in the in the in the delays and when you have lower percentages of autonomous vehicles there are some vehicles that are delayed uh, significantly more several that are delayed significantly less so the variability uh, is much higher with al our algorithm we were able to reduce that band. Um, so that uh, vehicles may be, first of all, they're delayed less on the average, but also that there's a smaller range of delays within um, that group of, uh, of vehicles. Um, in our simulation, and I showed the results, So that um, we we feed that information into the autonomy, and then the autonomous vehicle makes decisions based on that information. That can accomplish a couple of things. First, it can help with evaluating the logic of the autonomy based on realistic scenarios within a simulation environment. Um, but we also wanted to see how an autonomous vehicle operates within a micro simulator so that we have a better way of predicting how the network will work once we have autonomous vehicles in it. Um, right now we can only assume what an autonomous vehicle will do 
uh, and so having uh, you know at least one vehicle vehicles autonomy in the loop at least we get some idea of uh, how we might be able to model that in in micro simulation uh, of course every vehicle every autonomous vehicle has its own logic but at least this gets us a little bit closer to how we're able to model um, autonomy within uh, micro simulation Um, so, um, as I said, data are extracted by VSIM, um, they're fed into the autonomy and, uh, and vice versa. So this is, we're kind of in the process of, of, uh, of doing this. We still don't have uh, final results, but that's the, that's the hope. Um, in terms of simulation, I'm going to show you quickly um, a, an animation that is um, the top shows autonomous vehicles, the bottom shows conventional vehicles for the same demand and how uh, one of our PhD students uh, did an optimization of trajectories to see how um, you can optimize the movement of um, vehicles through a ramp. If you, again, full control, full autonomy, uh, here's how it, what it looks like. Um, with uh, conventional vehicles, you have usually uh, more of a uh, congestion that starts on the rightmost lane. But with autonomous vehicles, if you're able to push vehicles to the left and take advantage of, of gaps, then you can redistribute and, op and maximize um, the throughput. So uh, that's the idea that we're working with. Uh, we, we have some work on, uh, uh, on freeways, and we're doing some work on roundabouts. And that's similar to the idea for uh, what we're working on for signalized intersections. That's where we're, we're trying to get to. Uh, so I'm going to talk now about the transition to practice and where we are, what the work that we've done, and what we have found. Um, so the, the objective is to be able to implement this algorithm so that it operates in the field with conventional vehicles um, and autonomous vehicles. So we have done several uh, experiments in a closed course environment, and I'm going to show you some video from that. Um, but the, the objective is to have a deployment in, in Gainesville at an intersection. Um, we, of course, for us to deploy, we have to test the, um, the algorithm under many different scenarios, which is where we, uh, where we are right now. And uh, the objective is to have, in the end, um, evaluation of before and after, how it works, um, how the intersection works before and how it works after. So the we did an initial um, test um, at the, it's called the Thurl, the Traffic Engineering Research Lab in Tallahassee, in Florida, which is a closed course environment. It has a, a couple of signalized intersections. We used one of them. Um, and we connected our uh, computer with their controller, uh, with their setup, um, and we brought our own vehicles, some of them instrumented, some of them conventional, and we um, evaluated how the hardware and the software um, work. So um, this is the... This is the closed core intersection, and so one of the uh, one of the challenges is that one of the approaches comes at an angle, uh, which requires us to have low speeds. But it really doesn't matter for our it didn't matter for our purposes in a closed course environment, uh, because the objective was to make sure that the algorithm worked, that the uh, information was communicated, and um, and all that. Um, so the the first that test we did. Um, was in uh, 2017, um, and I'm going to show you uh, a little video from, this was one of our first tests, or the first test that we did at the Thurl, um, and uh, we had, um, we had a, a drone to be able to capture what was happening, we had video from many different uh, um, angles. Um, uh, our trailer there in the corner and our uh, um, connections to the to the signal controller and so the objective what we were trying to do is to make sure that the vehicles that were equipped were receiving the information um, as they w with a trajectory that was intended for the vehicles to follow 
Um, everything is, of course, very low flow. It, we only had like six vehicles uh, that we wanted to test. And so we wanted to make sure that the uh, information was being sent correctly, was received correctly, uh, that the signal controller was uh, providing the signal settings that we anticipated it was um, uh, to receive. Um, you can see the shadow of the, of the drone there. <laughs> Um, and one of our PhD students had to become a pilot to get this. Because uh, the drone, you need a special license, you need to have all kinds of um, arrangements to, uh, to make that happen. Um, but uh, one of our problems was um, we spent about two days. The first day, there were all kinds of problems with the times that were kept by different uh, pieces of equipment. So uh, there was a lot of real-time debugging. We finally were able to uh, make the things work toward the end of the second day when everybody was really exhausted. But um, we made it happen. It, it, it worked. And um, in terms of um, getting the, um, the software and the hardware uh, in place. Um, since then, we have done a lot more tests uh, in a closed cross environment. We've tested. We've been testing the autonomous vehicle, we've been testing the algorithm that it provides realistic scenario or realistic trajectories for vehicles to follow, uh, that, the, that the fusion work um, is, uh, um, is what we intended uh, to be. And so there's, there's a lot more that we still need to, to work on, uh, but uh, this was kind of one of our first, um, um, first efforts. And let me show you the, the fusion work. Um, and this is, uh, this is at the intersection where the, um, we're going to deploy um, the algorithm. It's, uh, it's Stadium Road and Gay Lemerand. Uh, this is the football stadium, the 95,000 people football stadium. Our office is on the other side. Um, so we are setting it up so that we can uh, detect vehicles as they arrive from a certain distance. Um, and what you're seeing here is the, um, the green is what we communicate as the optimal trajectory, and then the orange is what the vehicle is, is actually doing. So we're doing some initial experiments with, uh, with the sensor fusion. The sensor fusion tells you the vehicle is arriving, uh, here's the, um, the trajectory that is being generated for that vehicle, and here's the, the actual one, and we're comparing the two. Uh, one of the things we want to, to do is to make any adjustments in the way um, we anticipate the conventional vehicle to approach the intersection, and so that we can uh, change the way the algorithm uh, predicts what the vehicle um, is going to do. Um, there's a lot of testing that goes on right now, and this is a combination of um, uh, radar, um, uh, DSRC, and, uh, and video. And uh, one of the new uh, radar detectors we're getting is it's, a, it's called a 3D uh, radar detector, and it's supposed to be more accurate. So this is the next step. We're going to be testing that um, at the intersection. In terms of risks and challenges for, uh, for this effort, one is the, um, the detection. Uh, because we, in order to make this happen in, a, um, in an existing highway environment, we have uh, the detection range and accuracy uh, are a big issue because we rely on that information for us to uh, complete the optimization. Um, and we're finding that the data fusion is essential. We don't want to rely on only one set of, uh, uh, of sensors. Um, the driver behavior is an important component because um, being able to anticipate what a particular driver will do is, is not easy. And that's why re-optimizing more frequently and being able to adjust uh, the signal timings based on what conventional vehicles are actually doing um, is important. Um, having the um, re-optimization also allows us to um, uh, address any um, congestion effects. 
um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of our projects, one of our new projects, uh, is looking into how do we detect pedestrians, how do we uh, use sensors that can detect it, and then how the, that information is fed into the algorithm so that we can have um, the optimization address um, pedestrian phases as well. Um, in case of uh, um, communication failures, we want to set up the signal so that it goes back to pre-timed, uh, so that we're able to test it in a real-world um, environment. So where we are right now is the, uh, as I said, we have converted the, fi the, uh, the programming into, uh, into Python, and uh, we're doing testing um, of different scenarios and cleaning up uh, bugs. Uh, testing the uh, the sensor fusion, um, looking into the modification for pedestrians. Um, we're going to do some additional testing at the Thurl, um this fall uh, with planned uh, field testing at the intersection um, in the spring 2020. We've uh, requested permit to test this new algorithm at the, at the intersection in Gainesville. Um, we want to be very careful because this is, if it's going to be operating in the real world, we, we want to make sure that everything works. But so we're, we're, we're planning to do some testing over the weekends and really early uh, morning Sundays, let's say, when there's not too many vehicles at the intersection so that we can have some initial uh, tests done with very, very low flows uh, and collect information very carefully in the real world environment and then um, hopefully being able to operate it under um, higher demands. Um, so uh, again, this is part of the of I Street, uh, which you've already heard me on, on that. Um, and there are, we have several publications, uh, if you have an interest, uh, which um, details the different algorithms that we have implemented um, and uh, anything from the optimization to the, to the sensor fusion. Uh, that's, it's not a complete list. We have a website for our, um, uh, for our project called Avian. Uh, so if you look, look up Avian, you will uh, uh, look at a um, complete list of, uh, of publications and so on. So with that, do uh, you have any questions? Happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is that one? Uh, oh, the, this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. It's uh, fully controlled, so we don't care. We just basically take over the way we would like them to operate based on the rules of the road and maintaining a, um, a minimum headway that is consistent with what the conventional vehicles would do. So kind of corresponding to a 2200 um, uh, capacity, so about 1.8, something like that, of a headway, yeah. There's no car following. It's just full. Um, keep this movement until you uh, with a minimum headway. So it doesn't. Uh, one doesn't depend on the other as long as you have a minimum headway that is being maintained. So um, you maintain a, a minimum headway. Where so you create those gaps so vehicles can merge in and you create them by moving the traffic tool um, to the left. Yeah. We didn't do it for this case, but uh, yes. Um, so we in this case, we considered every vehicle um, an isolated vehicle. And uh, because the, um, our objective was to, minima to have the minimum headway, if you have the minimum headway at the departure, then it doesn't matter what the platoons are. You just packing everyone in a certain way so that they get through at the maximum speed at the minimum headway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I 
think it. I think it was the defaults of w of the way that the. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think it was the defaults. I don't think we we changed. I mean, yeah, you you can play with that and make it uh, be more efficient and change the the rules there. But this is kind of what, yeah, as a default, this is how it it would work. And it's I don't think this is inconsistent with what we see in the in the field in terms of starting the um, the congestion on the on the rightmost. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you'd have different behaviors if you played with that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, you'd have different uh, performance. Yeah. What else? There is nothing out there. There's nothing out there, and so that's why uh, you know we what we wanted to do is to have this autonomy in the loop, so that we at least see. How would uh, our own autonomous vehicle function within the network, so that we have something to start with, to see, you know, if you if you simulate something in VSIM with autonomous vehicles, right now you'd have to make all kinds of assumptions, and you have no idea if is it right or wrong, or, and you know, every of course every autonomous vehicle is going to do its own thing. You know, Ford uh, is going to do something different than General Motors. We don't know, and they're not going to share that with us, and so. Uh, you know, again, we will be left with trying to observe with what's happening in the field, but there's not enough data right now to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you, Lili.